Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. In this week's video, we're going to go over a Q&A session. This is going to be part one, hopefully of many. And over the last couple of days, I've been gathering questions across social media about my life as a physician, as a tech person. And I had to compile a list of questions, which was fortunately pretty extensive, but a lot of the questions were um, asking more or less the same thing. So I, I parsed them down to a handful of them, which I'll go over in this week's episode. So let's go ahead and get started and see if your question was answered. So to kick things off, very first question, of course, do you like to work together with nurses? And the answer is an absolute yes. Uh, it's just not the bedside nurses, but it's the whole multidisciplinary team, especially on the ICU side. It's super, super important to utilize the training and skill set of respective team members on the multidisciplinary team while they're providing patient-centered care. And this is something I've touted many, many times through multiple channels, uh, multiple posts, and this is just kind of my philosophy of medicine overall that I try to instill on my trainees because you would be aloof if you didn't utilize every team member to the best of their ability. Uh, it's, just, it's just, in my opinion, the way to practice medicine. How long was your training and did you do a fellowship in ICU? So in July of 2017, I completed my anesthesiology residency, moved up to Boston to do a fellowship in critical care medicine and then a year long fellowship in cardiothoracic anesthesiology. So yes, I did do a fellowship in critical, critical care medicine. I did 11 years of grade school, uh, three years of college, four years of med school, four years of residency, two years of fellowship training, and I've been an attending for about 11 months now. So it's quite the journey, but it was totally worth it. Um, I wouldn't, wouldn't change anything about it. When did I start coding? So we're not talking about code blue coding, we're talking about computer coding. So back in grade school, in high school specifically, I took a computer science class, which just totally changed my life. Something about it was very, very appealing to the mathematical side of me. And growing up, I used to build computers. That was actually another question someone asked, when did you start building computers? Um, together, I, I would say between my dad, who used to work for a software company and bring home like junk parts, uh, and I would put, put them together and I would sort of build a computer, some Frankenstein monstrosity. But I learned about how different hardware components work together to ultimately create a machine that, that works and the different considerations surrounding that. So this was when I was like a single digit age. Uh, and over the course of my life, I've built probably four or five computers, including my gaming rig that some of you all may have seen in the last video. Um, but the computer coding thing didn't happen until high school. So I took two computer science classes. And at that point, I was learning about JavaScript and object-oriented programming and, and things like that. And then in the last probably 10 years, I picked up a lot of web-based programming languages, JavaScript, HTML, CSS3, uh, PHP, things like that. And in the last probably two years or so, I've started to dabble in Swift. And that's how I came up with my Echo Tools app for iOS, shameless plug right there. But um, I never took like a formal class in anything like this. I've used a lot of Stack Overflow and YouTube and stuff like that to, to figure it out. But if I could go back and do it all over again, I'd probably do Python this time. Um, it just seems to be a much more utilized language these days, but uh, it is what it is. I know what I know at this point, and uh, it's helped me get through a lot of challenges and opened up a lot of doors throughout my life. What would you be if not a doctor? So this question comes up pretty often too. And if I could do everything all over again, I would have been a math and physics major in college. And I would either be like something in astronomy or engineering or something in computer technology. So whether that's a software developer or working for like Google or Apple or something like that, that'd be pretty awesome. I like this question. What drives you to be the MD that you are? I had a very influential professor back in med school, very early in my, in my med school days. He was a basic science teacher. and Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago from complications related to pancreatic cancer. But he's the reason for why I do a lot of what I do, whether it's medical education, whether it's the respect goes 100% to the patient and the team, not to you as a physician. So this is part of the reason why I don't like to be called doctor. I, I'm first name basis with my patients and my colleagues. Um, he was someone who was extremely well respected and, and he was always harping on fear of mediocrity. You don't want to be mediocre. You don't want to be average. There's so much to know in medicine and so much to do in terms of research and education and all of that, that you never want to feel that you're just achieving what you need and nothing more. You need to strive to be excellent. You need to strive to be better than you think you can be. And constantly having that mindset is really what set my 
career into motion. And it's that fear, <laughs> the fear of mediocrity that, that really, really drives me. How did you avoid becoming discouraged by all the things we need to know? And this goes back to the last point where that fear of mediocrity is constantly pushing me to want to learn more. But more importantly, we're lucky. There are a lot of people that didn't get to their health profession school of choice. I know a lot of people who applied to medical school and didn't get in. So I need to sort of pay homage to those individuals who would have been great physicians, but just because they didn't have that perfect GPA or perfect MCAT score, perfect whatever, uh, they weren't even given a chance. So I have to constantly remind myself that, hey, if I'm slacking, I'm losing an opportunity here that a lot of other people were really, really looking forward to. And, and my patients deserve someone who's willing to, to put in the time and energy to learn as much as they can. Because at the end of the day, one of the things that constantly keeps me driven is perspective. I am not that patient. People who complain about being in the hospital, like, oh, you know, I have to work this vacation day or I have to work on the weekend, whatever. That patient doesn't want to be in the hospital any more than you do. So pay homage to them, keep some perspective and, and do the best you can at all times. <laughs> Top pet peeves as a doctor. Um, I always harp on work ethic and humility above all else. And laziness is something that I absolutely cannot stand in, in the healthcare setting or just life at large. Uh, and whether that's my trainees, it better not be one of my trainees. If you guys are watching this, you know I'm after you. No, I'm just kidding. But they, they know that I can teach them stuff. I can teach them knowledge. I can teach them skills, procedures, whatever. I can't teach them work ethic. They have to bring their A game every day they work with me and everything else will follow in suit. And this, this extends out to my nursing colleagues, my multidisciplinary team colleagues, everyone. If you are willing to put in the work, then I can appreciate what you're doing. If you are blatantly being lazy, which is a very, very, very small minority, fortunately, but it's clear as day and I'm not going to waste my time. So whether you're like a, a trainee, a resident, a medical student, whoever following me or shadowing me or whatever, if you're not willing to put in that extra work ethic, I'm not going to be able to help you. I'm not going to bother. I'll just send you home. And that's just me being honest. Like that's my biggest pet peeve, laziness. Uh, your patients deserve better and, and I'm going to hold them accountable for that. How do you manage your time as a attending physician and on social media? So admittedly, I don't sleep much. Um, I wake up usually around 4.30, 4.45 each morning, and I sleep pretty late. Um, when I wake up, I get to this computer, I read about my cases for the day, or if I'm on the ICU side, just make sure um, I know what happened overnight to my patients, what their labs are in the morning, and all of that good stuff. And then I'll usually try to read one journal article in the morning, and then usually that inspires me to write some sort of post. So whether it's pharmacologic related, or whether it's a physiologic concept or something, uh, or just something that was in the news or something I'm interested in. That's what usually drives me to uh, create a post or revise a previous one and just make it look better. Um, this has been sort of an ongoing thing for the last couple of years since my fellowship training. And a lot of people, it seems that this stuff resonates with them. Uh, so it just continues to motivate me to keep going. And it's a big part of my life now. Like some people ask, oh, do you have a social media manager? Does someone actually answer these questions or create this content and all that? And I'm like, no. No, I, I'm the singular voice. Like I make all the content, whether it's my app, my website, my social media, uh, obviously all my lives and stuff like that. I don't have a sub in for me during these YouTube videos. Uh, it's all me guys. So you get to know who the person is behind um, the content and literally the camera in this case. But um, whether you like it or not, it's, it's what you get. So you know a little bit about the person creating the content. Okay, this is going to be the last question because it's my favorite question of all. If you could meet medical school Rishi, so like third year med student Rishi, at this point in your life as an attending for about a year, what would you tell him? And this is going back kind of chronologically. I was a second, third year med student probably seven years ago. Um, what would you tell him now? And what I would tell him is stop doubting yourself. If you feel like you want to do something, whether it's research, whether it's a uh, scholarly activity, whether it's a certain career path, an elective, or not even medical related, just something in life. You want to pick up a skill. You want to learn something. You want to go somewhere. Do it. Stop doubting yourself. Stop caring about what other people think. Stop saying, oh, you'll do it next, next year, next month, whatever. Just do it because life is short. And at that point, I was a third year med student when I was like maybe 23 or 24. That's 
a lot of my patients have died at that age. So you never know when, when your life can take a turn for the worse. Just do it. Your gut instinct telling you to want to pursue something, there's merit to that. Just listen to it. And if your life can accommodate that, do it. And that's what I would tell a uh, third year med student, Rishi, <laughs> as well as uh, you should probably sleep more and stop worrying so much. I'd probably tell him that too. All right, guys. So thank you so much for listening to this Q&A. I know I didn't get to all the questions, but please, 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 uh, if you have any questions, leave a comment below. Subscribe to the channel for more content, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Take care, everyone.